I was asked this last week. Why do they sing? I mean, it is a brilliant question. Um, and it's not necessarily the easiest question to answer. Um, over the, over, certainly over history, there have been different theories. Um, a simple theory is because they can. They do it for fun. And pre-Darwinian theories would have been, they do it for us. Um, when we lived in a time where we just thought nature was just built for us, um, something for us to use and abuse. And when uh, cage birds were rife, and in fact, I think it's in 1930, uh, there was three million cage birds in this country, um, in living rooms and dining rooms. But going back to why they, why they sing, it isn't for us, it's for themselves. And it's a method of communication, just like our speeches. And um, they can communicate in other ways. Um, as the season, as we go through the year, a bird, most bird species will molt. So they will change their plumage and changes in colour is a way of communicating either to a partner or indeed to, if we take the example of a female mallard, which is quite arguably dull compared to the male. And there's a reason for that. And that's because she has created a, uh, a camouflage for when she's bringing up, when she's on the nest and when she's bringing up the chicks. Um, going, but they also use their bodies as communicators, as non-verbal communicators. So that certainly during the breeding season, lots of different species will use uh, their feathers to display. It, might, it may be using their wings, it might be using their breast feathers or their tail feathers. But still in most species, they will use, um, they will use song or call. And as we go through the year, the first one I put, the, probably the most important to start with is establishing and retaining territories. And that starts really around late autumn time when the food this is more our native birds rather than our migrants when the food supplies are a lot less. And so what they're doing there is they're ma making their stamp on the area that they are going to use as their larder. And so they don't want invaders in stealing their precious food. So there will be lots of uh, communicating that this is their territory. But as we then go through late winter, into January and February, that those territories also become areas where they're going to breed. And that so then the voice or the call uh, becomes important for another reason for the for the male, it, it's to attract a mate. And in most species, it we will come across two two species during the talk um, where both the male and the female do sing, but in most species it is the male and females will, will just be calling. They will also use it as conversation. This morning I had a good, great example of that is, I've, we've only got 30 foot of garden in East Dulwich. It's only a small garden, but we're lucky because we've got some mature trees at the back of it. And at the moment we've got fledgling blackbirds and we've got some fledgling blue tits. And it was noticeable the tits were doing seep seep calls. And that was mum and dad trying to get the fledglings to fly, and although they're still taking food outside the nest. And eventually that's really important for mum and dad because they don't want them at home anymore. Um, they've done their work. It's really energy sapping the, the uh, breeding season. They want to go out, rest and take in summer's larder. They can also be, uh, they'll also use it as a community, um, as warning calls. Again, this morning I had a magpie alarming, and the, the most reason we're getting alarm, birds alarming in our gardens or we hear them in the park is usually the predator, that feline predator, it's cats, which is their biggest, uh, which is the biggest predator of birds in this country. But it also might be that it might be us that we're walking too close to them, um, or indeed uh, it's birds of prey. And then if you take the example of, if you've been lucky enough to see a, something like a flock of starlings or a flock of rooks, 
um, coming home to roost at night where they roost in colonies. And if you're lucky enough, you'll there'll be hundreds and thousands of birds. They will be making an enormous clatter or chatter. And they're, and that's, and they're using their voice to share information, share information on where they've been feeding, what direction they've been uh, finding the best sources of food. So lots of different ways that they use their voice. Uh, moving on, um, so there's different functions, different sounds. We're going to concentrate on song because it's, it, we have to start somewhere. If we go into the calls, a lot of the calls are similar between species and bit quite difficult. Um, we will also come across two birds that also will confuse us because they are really good mimics. And then there will be, we'll come across a bird that actually uses um, its beak to make a noise, and that's the woodpecker when it's, it, it um, uses its beak as a way of defining its territory um, and also of attracting a mate, and it will also maybe drumming also to get food. Okay, now I, some tips before we go into, I'll, I'll still rattle on a little bit before we get into the birds. Um, just some tips when you're learning bird song. Don't try and run before you can walk. Take it slowly. Try and learn the first group I've, I've put on. There's four or five birds in this first group. Uh, they're common spe uh, I've chosen them because they're common species. They're species that we, we will hear in our daily uh, business. They'll be in, in gardens and parks, in woodland. They're everywhere. Um, and I think it's really important to just root in our mind um, just a small amount of species to start with and then build. I do believe that learning birdsong is hierarchical, a bit like learning mathematics or learning a language. Um, and you get, when I say get into the habit of being oral, human beings are very visual. Most of, most of the information we gather is through our eyes but try and train those ears. We actually do train our ears without knowing, particularly in urban environments. If, we, if we're talking to a friend, for example, and an aeroplane goes over our head or a car goes by, we automatically have trained our ears to disregard those sounds and concentrate on the conversation. Try and do that with birdsong. And that means ditching any distractions. You may not believe this. I led a bird walk and somebody was walking along with headphones in. Well, that sort of right really defeated the object. And when I go um, bird recording, I, and I mean by that tallying, I count birds in various areas. I, over a year, 90% of the birds I count, I only hear. And for one reason or another, the, uh, particularly at this time of year, it may be difficult to see them because the vegetation is lush, or indeed they may be hiding. Um, but to give an idea of how many birds are in a certain area, I will record their, their, their voice as well. So ditch any distractions, you need your ears, um, and get into the habit of being oral. And you can train, as I say, you can train your ears. So if, when we look at this first group, if you can really root them into your, into your uh, oral framework, and then you can start disregard, when you hear another bird sound, you can start disregarding those ones because you know them and you'll go, hmm, what's that new one? Okay, I've called them the skulkers. They, they've got a, a similarity about them because they are common. Um, they also tend to have small territories. They tend to be also lower lying than a lot of birds. They tend also to wake up first. They're the early singers, particularly in urban environments, something like a robin will be singing at two o'clock in the morning. Um, but most of these early singers will start around an hour before um, dawn. And then there's a period, there's a dawn chorus, as we all know, and then there tends to be a dusk chorus as well. And the reason for the that they start early 
to, is one to establish their territories for the day to say this is the bit where I'm breeding this is the bit where I'm getting my food I don't want you invading my territory but it also is a period of the day when it's cooler and actually their voice travels better um, and as yeah and there's the last one yeah you'll find these tending to live low in bushes and there's a wonderful picture of a blackbird what a beauty male blackbird we've discussed that it tends to be a low-lying bird let's just listen to its voice I have to say that Blackbird is one of our best songsters. It's just superb, superbly melodic, and also got a really deep resonance to it. Um, we'll go on to the robin, you'll see that difference. It's a thinner song. And if you're lucky enough, um, uh, I've had a Blackbird still singing in my garden. It started in February. It sounds to me that they've been really successful this year. They've had they can have up to four broods. This is a very late brood. Um, blackbirds were their first brood. In fact, there was one recorded in Burgess Park in January, something like the 12th, where she, uh, the eggs had hatched. Um, but usually it's around the middle of February. Um, and so, yeah, the bird in my back garden's singing, singing just like that at the top of a tree, which suggests he's had He's been a very successful season. Let's move on to the robin. So much more thinner. Still, still quite a pretty song, but quite thin and recognisable. Um, and the robins are really interesting also in that it's one of the few species where the female will, uh, will sing as well. And also a species that will sing all year round. We're now, unfortunately, because I do love bird song, we're coming to a quiet time. We're coming to the end of the breeding season. So middle of July, August um, and part of September, birds are getting much quieter. They've done their work. It's real energy sapping the breeding season. Then they go into a molt, but there's a lot of food around. So they don't have to talk so much. And we have to remember it's all a balance of energy for these creatures. Birdsong takes an enormous amount of energy. If you ever yeah, uh, if you ever, and it's a good tip to learn bird song, is to actually catch the bird, not in your hands, but just see the bird singing. If you see a, a wren singing, its whole body is shaking. It's fantastic. It's not just coming from um, a voice box. It's its whole body gets involved. It's tre tremendous amount of energy um, required. But as I say, the robin will be singing all the, unlike other species, will be singing in every month. Um, and its voice will change. It actually gets even thinner as we uh, progress to the autumn uh, and winter. Let's move on to the, I think it is the wren next. Um, troglodytes, troglodytes. In other words, it likes being underground. <laughs> it likes understory and shrubs and damper areas. Beautiful little, that's a, a cock wren there, with its tail up. Um, they can be difficult to see, but certainly in the breeding season, the male will be dotting around on uh, the tops of bushes. And this is how they sound. So for a little bird of about 
eight or nine grams. It's got quite a quite a long and loud song with that record, that trill at the end that you probably um, caught. And as I say, it's just fantastic. If you're if you're lucky enough to see this bird in full cry, its whole body is going um, tremendous. When they've um, analysed its song on a sonogram. It's uh, the full song, which we just heard, is something like 109 notes, um, which is just tremendous. And we, we uh, birds can hear in some ways better than us. We cannot isolate those 109 notes only on a sonogram and we stretch it out and make it slower, slower because we can only, I think it's 0 0.1 seconds between each note uh, that our ears can gather, and obviously for birds, it's uh, they can the interval that they can hear is much smaller, and I think that also helps us understand that they're not hearing what we're hearing. Just as your ears are different to mine, their ears are different to ours. They work mechanically in some in some ways the same as ours, but what we're saying is, uh, and we. I'm putting a, when I say the blackbird's got a sweet melodic voice, I'm putting a human value judgment to it. I can't say that the female blackbird is saying, oh, what a beautiful melodic voice that man over there has got. Um, it may be hearing it in totally a different way to what we're hearing. Okay, the fourth in this group, the classic, um, arguably is, I did say they're all common birds. Well, the song thrush used to be common, a very common bird, um, but it's now on, unfortunately on the red listed um, endangered species in this country. Um, surprising, I know, uh, where every small garden would uh, have a song thrush. There's less and less of them around, but you will get them certainly in the parks around here. There's some really good territories for song thrush. Dulwich Park, there's two song thrush territories as you go through College Gate, one on the right, one on the left. They were singing still on Monday, which suggests they had a nice long season as well. And I love their song, but they can be real confusing. These, they can mimic, and they can mimic not just other birds, they all mimic human sounds like car, or car alarms. And although the blackbird comes from the same family, it's a thrush, um, all blackbirds sound much the same. Some have a... Um, They'll have the same song, and you can differentiate between team them, where a song thrush is quite different, where each song thrush tends to have a different voice. The recognition is that they're loud, particularly in the morning. They're usually the loudest. And also that they re tend to repeat a phrase. Let's listen to one. Lovely, lovely, lovely and loud, and that did, 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 that was a classic re re repeated phrase that a song thrush will do, and they will go on for they'll go on for they they're really probably also our loudest um, dust chorus bird as well, and they'll go on for hours, and you'll see the male at the top of the tree just singing its heart out, fantastic. Now I was a bit cheeky because I've added a fifth bird to what, what I think is the basis of what you should know. Get to learn these. It was going to be four, but I added this one. And the reason is, it's, again, it's common. It's a low-lying bird. It is a bird that does come into our gardens. It's a bird that's suffering a bit at the moment because in urban environments, there's a a tendency to rip privet hedges out and they do like hedges they do like dense they don't like uh, trees they're like low-lying dense shrubs and typically if you get them in a garden they'll be in a, a, a privet hedge or if you're lucky enough to have a, um, a, a different species of hedge 
Um, and they're commonly known as the hedge sparrow, but they're not a sparrow. They're what is named an accentor uh, of the family. It's the only accentor that we have, and it's bizarre because all the other accentors are mountain birds, uh, and the dunnock certainly isn't. So it's known as the dunnock, um, but it is sort of sparrow size, and it's obviously got the redolence of a house sparrow with its brown, uh, its brown body. But it's got that distinctive grey head. In breeding season, you'll typically see the male on the top of the hedge, singing its heart out. Um, and generally, the rest of the year, it's quite, it's quite a furtive bird. And this is what it sounds like. So actually, compared to the other birds, certainly the robin, the blackbird, and the song thrush, this, that, the bird, one of the tricks about learning the Dunnock song is that it's, it does repeat the same song over and over and over. And it's quite, it, again, it's slightly like the robin, quite thin, but it's arguably more, slightly more melodic and certainly more repetitive. So that's our, what I've called the sculptors. They're the ones that I believe um, is a way of starting off, root those in. Um, I'm aware of time now. Are we okay? Yeah. Um, so group two, and I, pro I, I will probably, because I'm, I, I really do want to answer questions and give, you, give everybody enough time at the end. And, um, uh, so if you see me flick through a bird, don't be disappointed. Um, and there may be one bird in this section which I'll flick through. But um, I've used these uh, great tits, blue tits, and long-tailed tits. Again, are common around this area. Uh, they will all, they're all birds that will come. If you've got garden feeders, they will all come to the feeder. Then um, as we go through the day, they start singing later than the group that we've just heard. Think higher up, they tend to be most of the time um, during the year, they'll be flitting about trees uh, and they certainly nest higher up. Um, during the breeding season, during this time, we have, we, yeah, they all obviously come to feeders and they will take insects for their youngsters from shrubs. But generally, they're much more of a tree loving, tree loving group of species. First one I'm going to is the great tip. When we listen to the great tit, look at that beautiful bird with his fantastic bib. Um, when we listen to this, we go, oh, this is easy. Oh, I know the great tit, and I think you will. I'm sure we've all heard that every day simple two notes unfortunately the great tit has got about 40 different variations and can mimic other tits um so although its basic song is really easy and recognizable it can confuse and still does confuse me often um interestingly also this is the first i think it was the first bird in this country um one of the reasons there's a lot of scientific papers on great tits and blue tits is because they will come to nest boxes. And so it's easy to pick them up, have a look what's going on, ring them and, and, and check out their movements. Um, and the great tit, one of the research papers on the great tit was, uh, they found that it has different dialects. So it's got, um, not, and it's not necessarily just urban versus rural, although that is part of the divide. And there are other subtle dialects um, across Britain and certainly across Europe, um, to add to the confusion. Um, but there, quickly, I'll just go again. That's two notes. It's a classic way of denoting a great tip. Moving on, we'll listen, listen to the blue tip. 
Um, another great photo, that is. Quite different in, in the way it looks. It's a smaller bird than the great tit. It's got that lovely blue, well, this is in breeding plumage. It's got that beautiful blue crest and the bib is not quite, uh, doesn't split its whole breast. So you can see that wonderful yellow um, underneath. Uh, and another significant difference, most of our um, uh, uh, species that uh, are not migrants, so the, the, the birds that we see all the year round, most of them will have more than one brood. The blue tit won't. The blue tit will have uh, just the one brood. So if it's, there's a, uh, a problem with its nest, then that's usually weather dependent, um, then that's it. That's it for the season. They'll have to start next year. Whereas the great tit, like other birds, will have two broods. And indeed, as we saw with the thrushes, they can have even more. Things like pigeons, they can have six or seven broods. They'll just keep, keep going through the year. Big difference is the blue tit will lay up to 14 eggs. The pigeon will lay two eggs at a time. So it's a different way of, of keeping, of survive, uh, of the species surviving. Let's hear a wonderful blue tip. That last one, that last two two phrases it did, where it started with a seep seep and then went into its trill. There's a classic way of denoting it's a blue tit. They won't always do that. And sometimes where, when a great tit's uh, uh, and they're feeding together, the great tit will pick up the sound of the blue tit. And as I say, can really confuse. But it's generally, um, the, the, the difference in their voices is, as you have heard, it's not two notes with the blue tip. There is a trill. It's a longer song. I'm going to move through the next, the next one and go straight into the finches. Um, again, these, these are, you can see now the, the way this presentation is moving on. It's birds that we should come across in our gardens or our daily life. Certainly all three of these birds will come to feed us um, and uh, they generally are seed eaters all the year round, um, but as uh, like most birds, they will also be looking for insects to feed their young during this um, breeding season. Um, in fact, the goldfinch is an interesting example of uh, a bird that has, it, it, it's really successful around here um, and generally in urban environments, something though we, we wouldn't have said. 30, maybe 40 years ago. And it would seem one of the drivers has been, in the 1970s, we lost birds across, across the board due to an intensification of farming methods. And there's a severe drop off in all, a lot of our songbirds, and which we're still suffering from. Some birds were more successful than others um, in, and then came into urban environments like the goldfinch. But alongside that, we were losing house sparrows, as you know, we all know that the massive loss of house sparrows. So on the back of that, so goldfinches have done well in one way because they adapted from farmland environments, but also because there was food, uh, a food source that was ready, uh, that was not being taken um, by sparrows. Um, I'll just put a little note on there. We green finches and chat. I used when I first moved into East Dulwich uh, 15 years ago, I put up feeders within a week. I had 12 green finches. I haven't seen a green finch on my feeders for five or six years. It's really suffered from a, a disease called trichomonosis, which is a canker, which only used to affect pigeons, but now unfortunately affects um affected green finches starting about 20 years ago and has latterly started affecting chaffinch. It's not a very nice disease at all um, because what it does is blocks up the airways. So they can't eat, they can't drink and eventually they can't feed. Um, there is 
a feeling that it's plateaued out now, which is good news. Chaffinch, look at that male chaffinch, breeding plumage, really bright reds and oranges, gorgeous, and that wonderful grey on the top of its head. And let's see what it sounds like. I always find that bird one of the easiest, uh, quite distinctive. It, it repeats the same. It's quite, um, it's quite deep and rich in texture. Uh, classically, around here, a good place to hear chaffinch is around Dulwich Park Lake. I don't know why that is, um, but they always seem to breed there. We also. Uh, with the chaffinch during the winter we often get if there's a severe um, uh, loss of food it's usually down to uh, uh, temperature um, in Scandinavia we'll get an influx of chaffinches from yeah they'll come all across the North Sea um, and we will we will get an increase in our population and uh, uh, that's if you sometimes a phenomena that you'll notice if you anyone knows around this area Sydenham Hill Woods they do like beech mass there's quite a few beech trees in Sydenham Hill Woods and that's another good place particularly um, during the autumn where you can see um, chaffinch right moving along to this cheeky chappy the greenfinch a bigger bird bigger bill tends to dominate the feeders um, if you've got little tits to come into the feeders or chaffinch. Although I find also chaffinch aren't very good at hanging on. They tend to just stay on the ground and get the stuff that, the messy stuff that the greenfinch um, doesn't eat. And I don't tend to describe um, uh, bird song in because we all have different ears. I mean, the great tit, uh, arguably you could call it the squeaky bite wheel, but some people are say, no, it doesn't, it sounds like a wheelbarrow that needs oiling. Well, there's a greenfinch, sounds as it should stop, be a good idea if it stops smoking. Again, quite distinctive. So it's got that sort of like, just a, a rough, as though it's got a, a rough, it's woken up with a, a rough throat. Um, that's classically a sound that you'll hear on the top. If you hear it, it would be, the greenfinch would be at the top of the tree. Um, classically a mature tree, calling like that. Um, again, because I've added some birds that I believe are, um, uh, relevant to the Bell House um, garden. I've just gone straight through the goldfinch. If we do get time, I'll go back to the goldfinch. But I'd like to go um, get it relevant to Bell House. Um, and I've added these few slides on uh, three species, the great spotted woodpecker, wood pigeon, and the stock dove. All three I've seen in this garden. Great spotted woodpeckers come to regularly has come to the bird feeders in the garden. Wood pigeon, as we all know, is quite a common bird, a very successful urban bird. And the stock dove will come on to, because there's a little bit of a story there. So the great spotted woodpecker, there's a beautiful male. You can tell the male, the male's got the red spot on the back of its head, the female doesn't. She, she will have that red underwing. Um, Typically, we we'll like deciduous woodland. Now, there's a pair knocking around here. Now, I don't think they're actually nesting in Bell House Garden. I may be wrong, but it's not far away. There's going to be one of the gardens along this road uh, where they're coming from to feed. And you'll see them certainly in Sydenham Hill Woods around here. And there's a couple of pairs in Dulwich Park and a pair in Bel Air. 
And this is typically what they sound like. He says, Fantastic. So it's quite can be quite haunting if you're in the woods on your own and you suddenly hear this random uh, drumming to the great spot. Um, fantastic. And of course, that's different to all the other birds because it's using its bill. It's not using... Birds have, to make this, their song and their calls, they have something similar to us called a syrinx. We have a larynx, as we all know. The di big difference is, is the syrinx has two membranes and the larynx only has one. And that helps us understand why a thing, a little thing like the wren can do 109 notes in such a short period because it's got two membranes vibrating, creating the sounds consecutively, simultaneously. Um, whereas we've got the woodpecker here not doing any of that. Um, it's calling for a mate, it's establishing territory, and it's also uh, creating a nest and getting food, all with its beak or bill. However, it is not true to say that it hasn't got a voice. And that one note call is, is a great spot using its syrinx. That is the call of a great spotted woodpecker. So now you know, so that's great. You'll be able to go around. You won't just have to hear um, the, the drumming on the tree. There is a call as well. And then moving through, here's the wood pigeon. We all know and we all love everywhere about. Um, it's a woodland bird. Um, originally, um, but it's, as we all know, it's adapted successful to urban spaces, and green spaces everywhere. And I put this bird in because it does come around here and, it, and it, if you've got a garden, it will come into your garden and typically will hoover up the mess that the other birds have made underneath the bird feeders. But also it will put into context the next bird we're going to hear. <laughs> So I'm sure that's a sound that we've all heard, and that's the wood pigeon. And then here we have another, um, as you can see, they're both, if I go back, they're both in the Columba family, so that's the family of pigeons, the family of doves. This is the stock dove. Now this is a really overlooked bird because everybody thinks it's a feral pigeon. The feral pigeon is the smaller pigeon to the wood pigeon. It's the one that commonly comes to us for bread when we're sitting on a park bench. Uh, or indeed comes to all the, uh, I know there's the people who come with bag loads of stuff. We've all seen them. Um, but the stock dove won't do that. And the stock dove looks very similar to the feral pigeon with that wonderful green fluorescence on its, um, on its neck. This is in breeding plumage. Um, whereas, so that's automatically a difference because they will all have that. Whereas we know with the feral pigeon, they're coming all varieties. But the big difference is, you can spot for yourself there, it's got a black eye. The feral pigeons have a red eye. And the other way that you'll be able to notice them, um, they'll have, they have a different song, which we're going to hear, but also they act differently. They're typically, if you see them, they'll be in the middle of the field. They're much more scared than feral pigeons. They won't approach you if you've got bread in your hand. Uh, and they'll be feeding on the ground in the middle of the field. There's several pairs in Bel Air Park. There's a nest on Cox's Walk. There's a nest in Dulwich Park. 
um, and there's a nest on the uh, in one of the gardens along the street with Bell Heise, and the pair, uh, the adult pair, have commonly, uh, uh, sorry, regularly, not commonly, regularly been visiting Bell Heise Garden. This is what they sound like. do that one again. It starts getting confusing because you get all the other birds chiming in. It's like winding up a clockwork. It's all in there. It's a... But quite distinct. It, it does sound like a pigeon or, or a dove because it is. Is from that family, but it's quite different to the to the voice of a wood pigeon. And then finally, I'm going to uh, two two birds that are, are, are quite different to the rest of the birds in the fact that they only they live they have a wintering quarters as well as breeding quarters. They use us for um, well and the rest of Europe and various other places to breed. So they they come in early spring. They have one brood. And then they fly back and they will fly back to um, Northern Africa, Western Africa and Iberia. So they're, particularly the chiff chaff is known as a short distance migrant, although I think for 11 or 12 grams, that's a pretty long way to fly from southern Spain to us. Um, doesn't do it in one go, comes in hots. Um, both species are, are really successful at the moment uh, for different reasons. Um, and most of our migrants are coming from Africa. And so things like you'll be hearing screaming parties of swifts if you're lucky, they're coming from um, the, the Sahel region and farther down. So that's, that, that's sub Saharan Africa. It's a long, long way. And right down to some of them, are things like. Uh, some of the Swiss will be coming from South Africa as well. Um, so that puts it in context why the chiff chaff is called uh, a shorter distance uh, migrant. The first one we're going to hear is the black cap. I wonder why it's called a black cap. It's got a black cap. And another species like the robin is different to the others where the female will sing. The female has a brown cap. Looks exactly the same. It's a brown cap. Typically a woodland species, but it's really well adapted to parks and gardens and it nests low down. Really interesting bird where it's the only bird in this country that we can definitely say that bird feeders have changed its life history or have been one of the major factors in changing its life history. We now do have overwintering black cats, and that's partly down to climate change, and it's partly down to particularly in urban environments, we are providing them with supplementary food. Um, uh, it's, it is a really interesting phenomenon that is, in, in, if we look at the world clock since time started, are we, we're on the sort of last seconds, aren't we? But this is a phenomenon that, uh, that's only come in in the last 40 years, which is a milli, 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 millisecond. Nanosecond, I don't know. It's small range. And this is what the black cap um, sounds like. Um, one of my favourite songs. Um, there is a uh, slang name for it, the mock nightingale. And you might uh, find out why now. on technicalities, there we go. Fantastic song. 
Um, this is another mimic, tends to mimic other birds. It's, it mimics traditionally um, a bird called the garden warbler, which is another African migrant, small bird, nests, eats much the same habitat as, uh, and, and breeds in the same sort of habitat as the black cat. So what the black cat, and it has a very similar song, so what the black cat does is mimics the garden warbler song and says, I'm a garden warbler, stay away, there's not enough room for you here, I'm here. So it's telling a bit of a fib really, but it's doing it for the right reasons. Um, but subsequent to that, you'll, uh, if you read into the black cat, it, it's, it, has, it has the ability to mimic other things. And I was lucky enough three seasons ago, I was doing the monthly count in Sydney Hill Woods and a black cat, male one like this one, flew right in front of me and landed on a bush and did this whole song and it was a blackbird song. And I went, no, 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 no. I've got no witnesses. I don't believe this. I've only got myself here. And then it did it again. And so what it was saying was, look, there's a blackbird trying to come into my territory. I don't want it here. So I'm going to pretend I'm a blackbird and say, go away. There was a slight difference. It did the whole blackbird song twice, um, but it wasn't as deep and resonant as, uh, as, uh, as what I would have expected a blackbird, but it did a fine imitation. I was lucky. And then finally, We'll come on to this wonderful bird, the chiff chaff. Chiff chaff, nothing to it. Really easy to miss. So it's not, I think it's not nice to say it's bland looking, but it's, it's classically termed a little brown job. Easy to miss. It's got a sort of fairly sweet voice. Um, but why I, why I love it so much is that it says to me it's the end of winter. It's our earliest migrant when it says to me when it comes in end of February, first week of March, and I hear the chiff chaff's metallic two notes. It says to me, yes, spring is here. And also it says sort of like the world's work working in, you know, there are, there's a lot of doom and gloom in nature. Um, um, and quite rightly, we're talking about it because there is some bad things going on. Um, but the chiff chaff has been particularly successful. Another, another bird that's starting to overwinter here has done for the last 20 years, not as many as with the black cat. Uh, there's been, there's lots around the area. Um, you're less likely, however, to get them in your garden because they don't, they don't come to feed us. And they also feed, they look, they're scoping, for insects uh, on the back of leaves on mature trees, hence Philoscopus. And when you hear the song, that's the rest of its um, scientific name, Colobita, which suggests um, the change in your pocket clinking. It's here, the chief chap. Hear it again. It's it's like the it's similarity with the great tip, just because it's got those two notes, but it's much more metallic. And thus quite yeah, very distinctive. Um, I've I've written a, a little blog on it. Um, if you ever get a chance to read it on London Wildlife Trust. Um, website you can there's a link there um, if you want to know a little bit more about its life history because it is absolutely if you dig into the life history of any bird the common birds it, it becomes um, you just unravel it's like an, an onion you unraveling layers of fascination and this little bird is one of the fa one of the astounding facts is that when it's building its nest, and its nest is terrific, it, it take, some birds, they just sort of cobble up 
um, a few twigs. This bird doesn't, it has layers and layers. And she will, when she's building a nest, she can take up to 1500 trips to build the nest, which I just find outstanding, you know, unbelievable really for a bird, it's 11 grams. So go home, what is 11 grams? I'm not a brilliant cook, but it's two big spoonfuls of sugar. And that bird, uh, just amazing. Um, and then it goes all the way back to Southern Spain and short little hops and has several rests. Enough. And there we are. How's time? Because that's our final slide. We have got some birds on one because it's a bit more real because often we hear several different species. Um, and I put a few credits there because the photos are fantastic. Certainly some of the audio links are brilliant. And I give credit to Tom Rogers who uh, helped me uh, on the original AV on this. And thanks to all the people at Bell Hatch. Well, thank you, Dave. Um, you certainly opened my ears up to the birds around us. Um, and and um, and I think, you know, Bell House has actually got this wonderful garden, a wonderful resource. Um, and I'm sure we're all wanting to, rec and to encourage more birds. Um, and, um, well, um, I, th I think we've already had a couple of questions put up on chat. So I'm going to hand you over to Sarah um, to, to read out some questions. Wait, let me see if I can go stop share or something. Ah, oh, I can see people, <coughs> can't I? Hello, Meg. Hello, Anne. <laughs> if people want to unmute, we've got a question from Lucinda who says, you mentioned birds start the dawn chorus early for territorial reasons mostly. What is the dusk chorus about? The dusk chorus is, is about food sources again. <clears throat> um, and, and also, the problem is with birds is that they don't all fit nicely in one category. So a lot of the things I've said are generalizations. But yes, the dusk chorus is it's particularly in things like the song thrush, I'm echoing a lot. Yeah, is that better? Um, sorry, Lucy, no, I, I was getting myself in there. Um, it, will, it, will, it will still be establishing territory. So what the bird has done is established its territory at the start of the day. And then as the day has progressed, it's fed, rested, fed, rested. And then towards the end of the day, it's going back to particularly song thrushes, blackbirds, they go to the top of the tree. During breeding season, they're protecting their mate, or not protecting their mate, they're making sure nobody steals their mate, but they're also protecting their food territory as well. Hope that helps. There, yes. there, 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 will, there will be little nuances depending on the species, but that is a general, a general answer. Okay, thank you. I think Lucinda was saying, oh, sorry, my voice is gone. Where's it gone? <clears throat> I don't know, it's that um, but... chaffinch or whatever it was. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> so when a, I, um, I'm going to ask my own question. Oh no, here we go. Where do the birds stay when they travel to Spain? So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> the cheapest B&B &B they can get. Um, <laughs> They will, well, if we take the chaffinch, it's interesting. There's, there's two warblers that come over here, uh, which mm -hmm. live in similar environments. They're good examples of how birds can be different. One's called the reed warbler, and guess what? It lives in reeds, and it comes over here in our reed beds and, and breeds. And in fact, another interesting fact about mm -hmm. the reed warbler is it's the chosen bird by cuckoos. Um, cuckoos will will. Uh, parasite any nest. Um, I think my brother said he had blackbird, but, um, but generally we'll go for reed beds, uh, reed, reed warbler. Then there's another bird which is very similar, lives in similar environments called the sedge warbler and prefers sedge. So again, wet environments, marshy environments. 
and they both come from a similar part of Africa, sub-Saharan Africa, and they're both a similar size. And again, actually, in the field, it's usually because they're down in the reeds. Um, it's usually their voices because their voices are distinctive. But the sedge, and they both weigh nothing. You know, they're a bit bigger than the chiff chaff. So I think they're 14 grams. The sedge warbler, when it goes back to Africa, does it in one trip? Doesn't bother to stop. So the way it, 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 its life history um, uh, unfolds is at the end of the breeding season, it feeds up, feeds up, feeds up, increases its fat reserves. And remember, there's a real balance there because it's got to get off the ground and be able to fly. And then those fat reserves take it all the way to Africa. The reed warbler, on the other hand, is like the chiff chaff. We'll do it in short, well, still long. Uh, for a little thing like that, um, but we'll do it in hops. Um, and where do they stay? Um, well, like all birds, where do all birds stay at night? They don't have a cosy bed. Nests are only used in the breeding season. Uh, sometimes nest boxes are used during the winter. Tits sometimes will do that. We'll use a nest box other than for breeding. But most of the time, they're huddled up if it's cold, in the middle of a bush or a hole in a tree or a crack in a tree, underneath some bark, in some bushes, a hole in the ground. Um, the chiff chaff will, uh, uh, will, will actually be surprised because if you remember what I said about the chiff chaff, it's, it's actually, uh, most of the time, it's spending its time in mature trees quite high up, but it actually nests in... Uh, um, a net is quite low down. It's actually quite, uh, it's open to a lot of predation by, in, in urban environments by cats. Um, so on its hops, it can, it will either be found low down in a thicket bush or it will be in a tree. Um, so uh, birds have different song for different situations. Um, alarm, mating, territory, etc. This yeah. confuses learning bird song. So where should one start? Well, well that's that's why I. I think I think uh, because of the. Is that because of me? So can you hear me? I can hear you, but oh. I'm hearing about six of them. Oh, sorry. I, I'll mute myself again in a minute. But I uh, think I think that question might have been asked because um, the beginning of the talk was was missed. So. Yeah. Yeah. I can't meet myself again. There we go. So the, the, the basis of this talk was bird song, um, because there's just too much to <laughs> talk about with within an hour. And also it's confusing. So learn song first. The calls are much more difficult because to differentiate between species, I get confused all the time. Um, particularly, say at the moment, uh, the call of a great tit and it's young versus the call of a blue tit and it's young can be really difficult. Um, the alarm call of a uh, robin can sometimes be confused with the alarm call of a wren, for example. Uh, the alarm call of a blackbird, you probably all know, um, it's probably the commonest alarm call we get. I had a great alarm call by a magpie this morning. Um, and that was because a local cat had come into the garden and the magpie was seeing it off with. Um, but yeah, so I concentrated on song first. And I think a, a, another tip, if we're learning, learn the song first. The calls will come later. Um, there are some birders out there who are Stanley, I, I, who've just got such amazing ears. They'll be going, oh, there's that, that, that. Uh, certainly during migration, um, uh, I know several birders who will be just going, oh, there's, and I can't even hear a thing. And that's because, not, not just because their um, hearing may be better than mine, um, it's also because it's better trained than mine. So train your ears on song first. Okay, I think that's... I no think more questions? I don't think so. Are we making the um, recording available at the end if, for people? Are you happy okay. with that? 
Yeah, yeah perfect. So <clears throat> I'm really sorry because I think some people had um, issues getting on at the beginning um, of the talk. So the recording will be available if you want to catch up. Um, I, I saw that Eventbrite sent out an email. So sorry about that. We'll try and work out what was happening. Um, but um, that was amazing, Dave. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you all.